found something in the ice. We need some help down here. I know I'm human. Some of you are still human. This thing doesn't want to show itself. It wants to hide inside an imitation. It'll fight if it has to, but it's vulnerable out in the open. If it takes us over, then it has no more enemies. Nobody left to kill it. And then it's won. Gentlemen, do you realize what we've found? A being from another world that's different from us is one pole from the other. You guys gonna listen to Gary? He can feed one of those things! That thing's alive, sir. I saw it. I shot it. I hit it. I know it. Nothing happened. It just kept coming at me, making a noise like a cat mewing. Captain, it was awful. You couldn't see those hands and those eyes. Captain, you've got to do something about it. You Hello and welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode we're going to be uh, doing a different episode to what I usually do. Usually I do a, um, a movie review but I'm very honoured to actually have uh, John Hammond come onto the show and his grandfather is the legendary John W. Campbell uh, Jr. who wrote the classic book Who Goes There? which was then adapted into a little movie called The Thing from Another World and John Carpenter's The Thing in 1982, which has created a massive fan base. So I'm very honoured to have John come onto the show to talk about his grandfather today. So John, welcome to the show. Welcome to Bite Size Cinema. A pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you very much for coming onto the show. First of all, John, um, before we talk about your uh, grandfather, who is probably one of the most... Uh, legendary authors of our time in sci-fi who as i just said you know wrote that book uh, who goes there um first of all just talk about yourself john uh has your grandfather's love of sci-fi has that inspired you in some ways um i think so i mean that's really my favorite genre of you know movies and books and stories as far as writing goes, no, unfortunately, I did not acquire that from him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, what's it like to to have you to know that your grandfather is this, you know, legendary, you know, uh, writer in sci-fi who has, you know, created, as you now know, uh, probably one of the best sci-fi movies, you know out there in the world we can say because when i speak to someone about horror sci-fi people t say mention the thing you know it's it's out there what what's that like uh it's always been you know just a, a, one of the favorite movies i've ever seen and it it always kind of struck me as you know it's a pretty cool thing that my grandfather had written the story it was based on but i really had no idea the fan base that was out there until actually Facebook. Yeah. Uh, That's where I learned, you know, the fan base out there is just incredible and everybody in it seems to be wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, talking about the, uh, outpost 31, um, for example, uh, with Todd Cameron and Peter about Abbott, a little shout out to those guys there. But, um, what a wonderful fan base. I've been on there for a few years now myself, you know, being a fan of the thing. And I think everybody, it, it's just a good bunch of people on there, isn't it? Talking about this film. And I don't know any other film out there which has been reviewed, talked about. People put posts on there about, hey, what do you think about this theory? It, it It's... It just keeps going on, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's just an amazing, you know, base of fans, which I think is a testament to your your grandfather and his writing. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, it's just it's been it's really been a roller coaster ride these last 
I don't know, seven, several years. The, just the, his legacy just coming back to the public and, and it just seems to have just exploded. Yeah, and I, and I think With, I think for any sort of writer to actually be able to write something and I think literature can te- stand the test of time. And I think I know I know your grandfather wrote an awful lot of other novels and sci-fi magazines, but I think um, you know who goes there is, really stands out, and I believe that that will stand the test of time. You know, with with the fan base and everything, I can't cannot see this going anywhere really. <laughs> I, I I completely agree. The younger generations seem to know, you know know about it and love it as as much as you know us older generations yeah well that, that's right i think you touched on that i think it's um you know the story of who goes there or the, the film adaptions i speak to people now of a younger generation in fact i was talking to somebody the other day about horror movies and sci-fi and they brought up the thing and this is someone in their 20s you know some someone from a younger generation and it's just a testament um, to that but let's turn back the clock um, back into was it the 1930s shall we say in the early days of your grandfather and his writings what do you think inspired him to write sci-fi where does that come from in your family do you think um, <laughs> I asked my aunt about this who would be one of his daughters and she said it was pretty much just, you know, a source of income at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, he, he wanted to, you know, uh, uh, how do you want to say, a supplemented income because he was a salesman by trade, I guess, in the beginning, in his younger years. And writing just became a hobby of his that turned into a very well deserved career (laughs) I think in some ways if you can turn a hobby into a career I think that's that says that's a testament to its own isn't it you know I mean because if you're doing something that you're passionate about and you can turn that into a career I think that's probably the best thing isn't it you know I mean it's uh um, I did do a little bit You're of research. Yeah. I did do a little bit of research um, with your grandfather and his writing, and I saw, you know, looked at what he's done, you know, with um, science fiction magazines like Analog, Science Fiction, um, and the outstanding science fiction magazines and things like that. And I think looking at his work, it looked like he was trying to sort of say, well. What I'm trying to do with sci-fi is trying to make it plausible in a way with science. So he's being able to tell a story in a way where he could say, I want to write stuff which the kind of like what the human race could possibly do in the future with facts and things like that. Is that something, that's just the research. Would you agree on that? Is that something that your grandfather was trying to do? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. He didn't try to glamorized science fiction he tried to keep it you know science fiction to the base of science and i and i love that because um i've mentioned it before my show i'm just going to throw in an example there's a film obviously robocop which you're familiar with um you know came out in 1987 but in that movie it's obviously a sci-fi story and the technologies in that movie is kind of happened now over the last 30 years so in that film in the 80s they were saying that they had mobile phones computer touch screens and things like that whereas now we've got that and what I found interesting doing some research you know with your grandfather looking in the 1930s almost like he was predicting what was going to happen in the future and I know I know we spoke about this with private message there's an interesting story is it where there was something where you uh, your grandfather mentioned something about atomic energy and he got a call from the FBI or something yeah, like that. His, uh, his story, The Atomic Age. Yeah. When he was, at, I guess it would be right after he wrote that. 
But I mean, yeah, it was literally the way the story was told to me by my mother was that literally men in black came to his office and said, you need to stop writing about this stuff. And, <laughs> you know, of course, he's going to ask why. And the reply was because we're doing it. Wow. That, John, <laughs> that, that just blows my mind right now. Do you know what I mean? For you to say the men in black, you know, this is just amazing. I mean, knocking on your door to say, yeah. you've just predicted something that we're doing. And again, yeah. I think that's testament to his writing to say, I am, my writing is going to be based on almost like science fact in the right. storytelling. And then, and then he's, he's basically done that. As a, you know, as, as an example, it just blows my mind. Yeah. Um, which kind of worries me, John, a little bit, because does that mean that if he's predicted <laughs> that, does that mean that there's a thing out there that could possibly land on our planet <laughs> and take us over? Has he predicted that somehow? <laughs> Is one, there really something in the never knows, do they? <laughs> I guess we'll find out one day. <laughs> So, and the other thing is, um, this is the other thing, uh, uh, doing some research, you know, on your grandfather as, as well, it's just blowing my mind because he, he pretty much shaped sci-fi. You know, I'm looking at he, you know, with Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, these guys were influenced by him and, you know, today's sci-fi, we've got things like Star Trek with Gene Roddenberry, Star Wars, Alien. It, there, there's an influence there and it's almost like you know if if it wasn't for your grandfather it's we wouldn't have this structure of sci-fi today would you agree on that is it is that a sort of yeah definitely i mean i would i would think that i would consider that more than just an opinion but you know i think there's actual fact behind that oh a fact yeah absolutely yeah looking at his work um and then you mentioned, um, okay, he helped, you know, influence. Yeah. Like, for instance, the Isaac Asimov, he was one of the better known ones, and Heinlein. And you mentioned um, the iRobot influence. Um, we spoke about that. You probably messaged me about that. What was the um, story behind the iRobot, which has obviously been turned into a movie with uh, Will Smith and... Yeah, so uh, that's that's actually one of my more favorite stories my mother uh, shared with me was when Isaac Asimov brought the story to my grandfather. After he had written it, he asked, or well, he pretty much stated that, uh, or yeah, I'm sorry, he asked Isaac what does he if he realized what he had done in the story, and not knowing, my grandfather explained to him that he had in the story developed the three laws of robots. So then after that, they were added to the story. And that's, I th I'm, that's as I'm told, that was why he was given credit as being the grandfather of robots. Wow. Credited in the story. Again, that's just amazing. That, you know, stuff like that, that blows my mind, you know, especially with, um, when you put that in terms of modern day cinema with things like Westworld and films like Terminator and what I just mentioned there with Robocop. So this is kind of like the uh, building block of science fiction back in those days. Do you know what I mean? And it's it, it's just amazing how we've come today with, um, again, your grandfather using science fact words today. I think we are almost coming into that generation of robots now. So again, those old stories. Yeah, just, we just hope that we can stick to those laws, huh? Oh yeah, this is it. Yeah, that's right. We don't hope we don't have a whole full-on like Terminator, whatever happened in those movies. But um, yeah, it's it does fascinate me, and I think um, the other thing that I liked, I did listen to an interview the other day, just doing some research for you know today's show. There was an interview that you grandfather did in 1962 which was fascinating it was a really good interview and he was saying that sci-fi doesn't always have to be to do with um, going out into space with spaceships he was saying right. that he, his influence was a lot to do with the old 
Greek stories of the, like Odyssey, um, mm-hmm. where they would have a ship and go around the Mediterranean and go on adventures. And he said that that is science fiction um, on a different type of level because they are getting into a ship science has propelled them to another land and then they go on adventures and he said that's where I've kind of got my inspiration from I kind of like that do you know what I mean it's kind of just yeah. taking it from there and then yeah. I believe I know which interview you're talking about it's been a while since I've actually watched it so let's go on to the um, so John's John's work coming into like the into Hollywood with the 1951 thing, the thing from another world, uh, which was a movie that I watched when I was very young, I loved it. I still do. Um, what did uh, what did what did he think of that movie? Did he? What was his opinion of that? Um, I'm not really exactly sure what his actual opinion of it was, but yeah, I would love to have been you know alive when he before he passed. But that would be one of the questions I would have asked him. Um, I don't think he was against it. You know, I I think the only thing that really he wouldn't have disagreed or he would have disagreed with would be the actual monster. Yeah. Because he wrote the story, leaving it to the reader to imagine their own monster, what the monster would look like and if the monster would look like anything particular. Yeah. And what do you think that he would think now today looking at the John Carpenter 1982 thing? Because a lot of people, and it is said that John Carpenter did actually base that movie very close to the book Who Goes There in terms of the monster and the atmosphere and everything. Well, definitely. He definitely got the... How do you say it? Um... (laughs) The sense of paranoia yeah. he definitely hit that right on the mark, and that's also what my grandfather was shooting for. Yeah, yeah, because um, you know, we, I, I mean, I had a look at the novel, and you know, I've sort of compared it to John Carpenter's, and it's all about the monsters in the shadow, and the um, I think compared to the 1951 Howard Hawks film. John Carpenter's one is certainly, and we all know this because we talk about it so much, is the tension of trust. And you've got to look closely next to the person you are because they might be the thing. And all I would say is just personally myself, I love, as you know, I love the movie, fantastic movie, solid, everything. Um, But I've also, also seen it as a sort of, and now I think this is where it goes back to the science factors. It's almost like a bit of a social commentary as well in terms of sometimes you don't have to have the alien monster because if you put a group of people together as humans, you can still have that mistrust. And do you know what I mean? That seems to be a general thing in today's social society. Does that sort of make sense? Which uh, I Yes, like. it does. Yeah. It's more so now, I think, than ever. Yeah. Um, because I have read a few, you know, um, some articles where people, oh, it's my own, my own personal view on this. It's, it's a bit like you could be, could have known someone for many years and then all of a sudden they've become the person who you didn't think they were. Does that make sense? All of a sudden it's almost like they become a monster or something. You think, I've known that person for a long time and now they've changed. And I think with the thing, especially from 1982, I kind of, you can pull a lot of things out from it. You can either watch it as a sci-fi movie or you can watch it as a sort of social commentary, as I said. And I think that's why this film holds up so well is because there's there's so many talking points and so many different ways to look at it. And and I think that's why it stands the test of time, you know. It's just... Yeah, I, I agree with you that 100%. I think the I think it got you know we all know it didn't do well in 1980, yeah, 82 and yeah but it's I mean it's still being streamed it's still being played on cable and it's in the again we we'll go back to the fan base it's just incredible yeah it's um, 
yeah, like I say, it just blows my mind, really. Um, I just think it's one of those things where possibly at the time when the thing came out, it just might have been possibly a film that people at the time just didn't get because obviously there was the other movie that was out, like E.T., wasn't it? Do you know what I mean? Everybody was sold on the yeah. friendly alien. And then John Carbons has brought out this movie that I would say probably ahead of its time. Um, but now it's got its place in movie history, which it's quite rightly deserves. Everybody loves this film. And I think if this film came out now, it'd be a big movie. You know, it'd be, it's just, it just kind of fits the time. Um, and people talk a lot about the practical special effects and, um, and the actual character the characters of that movie as well and the performances are just incredible as well I think I think they did you know an, 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 John did an excellent job casting that movie so the other thing uh, John just um, we'll go back again to the movie to the 82 thing especially um, but I just wanted to go into to mention some like awards that your grandfather have has has received and I know that you you went to go and receive one of those awards last year was it yes over in Ireland Ireland so do you want to tell us a little bit about that what what award was that it was the retro Hugo award they um, give those out at the world con every year and these were retro awards he's been getting these last several years um, they go back before Worldcon started. So they went back, I think, seven years that Worldcon and the Hugo Award wasn't available, I think. Yeah. So that's why we came up with the Retro Hugo Award. And um, is there anything else that you want to tell me about your grand- grandfather that you've. I know that you've spoken to other relatives and you've done a little bit of research. Uh- I was just that there's so many more other stories that I think are just to this day unknown or undiscovered, I guess, that I think are just fantastic stories. Mm. Like we mentioned the atomic age, that was a good one. And there's a couple more I'm reluctant to mention. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's fair enough. As of right now, but yeah, there's, like I said, there's uh, definitely other stories out there that are worthy of the read. Did you say something about a story that had been adapted into a movie, which kind of might might be a little bit shadowed by the thing or who goes there? Oh, yeah, and uh, I think it was 1951. Um, what was it? Story... Stranger Stories, I think, was the TV show. It was in the 50s, I think. But his story, uh, The Mighty Machine, I believe it was, was uh, adapted to an episode of that. Yeah. Going back to the, the Thing movies, because obviously this is, a, this is a big aspect of your grandfather. What do you think of the um, the actual sequels? Or the, there was a prequel that came out in 2011. Was you a fan of that movie at all? Of the prequel, yeah. I enjoyed it. I did. Um, my takeaway, what from it though, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a Debbie Downer, but you know, it was a very good movie. But it just, it, it just kind of mimicked the 1982 version. Other well, than it was cavities, not blood test. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I must admit. Yeah, that's kind of going backwards a little bit isn't it because obviously in the 82 yeah. one you've, you've done something so right to say you know because even one of the characters comes out and says say I'm getting done here because I floss and clean my teeth do you know what I mean it just doesn't sort of work yeah I agree with you on that <laughs> exactly my favourite lines of the movie <laughs> yeah what about the um, oh, there's an upcoming Bloom House um, they've, they've, they're, they're very big on the sort of horror genre at the moment what do you think of this new up and coming movie there's uh, been a little bit of, uh, uh, we're very excited about it yeah we're, we're hoping he does a, a good job with it I've seen a number of his movies and you know I was pleasantly happy with the movies I've watched of his 
you know, he's not, he doesn't use the big budgets that, you know, today's and recent years production companies use. Yeah, I, I must admit, I think um, I'm more of a fan of the story and the atmospheres compared to the budget, if that makes sense. I've seen some very good low budget movies. So, yeah, I'm with you on that one. Um, I think he'll do. I do believe he'll do a, a good job with the with the movie. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my take on it is anybody doing anything with the thing. I mean, we're always going to have the 1982 one. We're always going to have a thing from another world, which I think is, you know, the 1951. There's bits about that that I really like in terms of atmosphere. Um, I quite liked the 2011 prequel. Um, so it's, it was good to go to the cinema and watch something that was thing, you know, a thing movie. So I'm excited about this new one. Um, well, I've been hearing that John Carpenter will be involved with it. Yeah. Whether it be rumors or not. Um, I, I think, I hope that maybe he'll have a little bit of influence on it and, you know, do his best with it. And I'm, you know, I'm very, very optimistic they will. I believe that they will, they won't. They won't hurt it, I don't think. No. Um, um, have you actually ever met, like, John Carpenter or any of the cast or anything? Never had the opportunity. No? I spoke with Jason Bloom on the phone on a conference call once. Yeah. Or t- maybe twice. But that, that was just, you know, a kind of uh, – a meet and greet kind of just hello this is what our plans are and you know it was just kind of like that yeah and from that and from that conversation what i took away from that was you know a very good feeling that you know they're going to do a really good job with it. you know they're going to put their all into it they're not going to try and rush it and just to throw a movie out there yeah because i i would say that they that is some big shoes to fill isn't it knowing the fan base the popularity i think for any sort of director to be able to take on that film um you, you just know that you are you've got to be a little bit tender with it and think well i've got to produce something really good here so um but i, I know you know particularly myself i think peter abbott top cameron i think anything for anybody to actually say that we're gonna we're gonna do something with the thing I think it's just exciting. I'd, I'd like to go and see something else done with this movie. Uh, one of the things I thought of myself here was possibly like a... Uh, you know, like Netflix at the moment, they're doing a lot of good stuff. I possibly would have liked, or still would like to see, possibly like a sort of mini six-episode uh, TV adaption of the thing. Not necessarily um, like a... A remake of the '82 one, but some something spinning or something relating to it. Just personally, as uh, a fan. <laughs> again, um, very little I can say regarding that, but you know, you know, we never know. It, it, it could happen. Yeah. So that's just me as a fan. If someone said to me, I said, "Yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing a, a, a TV adaptation done well," um, but yeah, that's just, <laughs> that would be my wish. <laughs> We did leave that as an option, mm. you know. Uh, they w- they wanted to have that option, and we agreed to that. Yeah, uh, of possibly doing a series. And uh, a standout moment from from the eighty two movie, uh, John. Is there something in that film where you watch it and you go, "That's probably one of my favorite bits of the movie." Um, I have to say, it would probably be the scene with the spider head. <laughs> yes. And, you know, you know, the infamous, you got to be bleeping kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, I, I, I must admit, it, 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 on the whole, it's, it is one of those films that I just never get fed, off, fed up of. And everybody seems to say the same thing. They get to the end of that film and then they just say, well, I can get to the end and I can just rewind it or put it back on and watch it again. It just seems to get better and better with time. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And the other question here for you, John. This is the ultimate one. Anybody listening to this thinking, is he going to say it? But I'm going to have to ask you. And I think you know what I'm going to say is the end of the movie. So you've got Childs and you've got RJ McCready. RJ's just blown the thing up and, you know, everything's like burning down around him. There's only two of them left. 
What you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> If uh, only knowing what I knew then, I think one of them was infected. Oh really? Ah, can you broaden now, out? I'm not oh. so sure. I haven't. We haven't exactly gotten through. A you know a sequel per se, mm. but I can tell you that that is in the finishing stages. Oh, okay, all right, okay, well, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, I, I that's just to uh, thanks to uh, John Bettencourt, right? Who who uh, helped us out with Alec Novella Lee his discovery of the original manuscript frozen hell yes and john bedencourt got that published for us and he is working on the sequel yeah i believe in the frozen hell there is a little kind of teaser of the sequel right okay so we just have to wait and see there with that in. <laughs> yep i mean <laughs> my take on it without knowing any of that as a fan of the movie watching the end of that film is what I like about it is the actual open end where it kind of says well we'll leave that up to you do you know what I mean and I think that's possibly what ultimately makes the film because I think a film is as good as the beginning the middle and ultimately the end that final bit can ultimately make the film and where they've just left those two characters there and it's almost like a sort of So that's all murder mystery, isn't it? You know, you're looking for details. I mean, so many people posted, oh, is it the breath? Is it the glint in their eyes? Charles with the little bit of metal on his ear, you know, with the, you know, the earring. And I think yeah. that's prob that's possibly what's whiskey. made it. Yeah, the whiskey. Is it a, is it a Molotov cocktail and RJ McCready, yeah. you know, grinning and stuff? And I think, you know what, it's just... I think ultimately it's left that discussion and it's just, it's kind of left that... I suppose you could say the fire is still burning with the fans, isn't it? So they're saying, oh. And it we, is. we see it all the time, don't we, on the Outpost 31 um, page where someone, someone's almost gone. They've posted it on the page and they've gone, hey guys, um, I'm going to say it again. What do you reckon? <laughs> it's just like, well, here we go. Is that discussion again. So I think that's a testament. I'm sure... I'm pretty sure your grandfather will be looking down on that with a big smile on his face saying, you know what, this is, and I'd like to say this is possibly his legacy with all the other fantastic work, but he's got his, you know, in literature, I think people look for their legacy and I, f I think this is it, you know, this is, and what a great one to leave, man. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I, I'm, I totally agree with you. Yeah, there you go, John. Well, listen, John. I, if there's anything else you'd like to share, I've, I'm, I think I'm happy to leave it with that. I'm really happy for you. You know, I'm really thankful for you to come on today. It means a lot um, for the show. Um, and, you know, there's listeners out there, I think, that'll be enjoying this uh, conversation between you and me. So thank you very much for coming on to the show and sharing that about you, your grandfather. And, uh, you know, thanks to your grandfather for creating this fantastic story in the sci-fi horror world. Well, I thank you for having me. I would just like to say that, you know, to everybody out there, you know, have a little bit of faith in Blumhouse and John Carpenter's to uh, do a very good job on this. I think it's going to, I think it's going to be all right. And I mean, all right. I mean, fantastic. <laughs> okay, John. Well, thanks for that, man. Well, like I say, I'm looking forward to it and I'm sure all the other fans out there are as well. So thank you very much. Um, like I say, I appreciate you coming on to the show today. All right, thank you very much. Okay, guys, well, there you go. That's, um, like I say, hope you enjoyed that. That's um, me talking to uh, John Campbell Hammond today um, about his grandfather and the thing. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that show. Um, I'm going to be closing the show now. So, um, as always, a little bit of admin for the show. I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast um, Network, so please go and check out all the other shows there. And I've got a Facebook page. If there's anything you want to post on there, any comments or any film reviews that you want me to have a look at. And um, 
you can also find the show on uh, the Legion Network, uh, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and several other players. On um, if you type in Bite Size Cinema Podcasts Legion on Google. And there you go, guys. So, as always, keep it bite size, keep it safe, and remember look close to the person standing next to you. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema Psyops, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show. Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.